Bill Clinton and Chelsea Clinton. Welcome. Um, we are so excited and grateful to be here in Manchester with all of you. I want to thank Dr. Huard and everyone at Manchester Community College who's let us all, frankly, invade today. So thank you for your hospitality. I want to thank um, Governor Hassan and Senator Shaheen for that warm welcome. And Senator, there's nowhere else I would be today except for here in New Hampshire with my mom. So I am... Uh, deeply proud to be my mother's daughter. I certainly hope that my 16-month-old daughter, Charlotte, feels the same way about me someday that I feel about my mom. Uh, and yet, as much as I stand here as a proud daughter, I stand here first and foremost now as a mother myself. Uh, my daughter, Charlotte, is uh, just over a year old, and I hope that my husband and I will be able to safely and happily welcome her little brother or little sister this summer. So... For me, this election is so fundamentally important because it is the first presidential election that I will vote in as a mom. Now, not surprisingly, in my family, it was impossible to not have known growing up that who was running for public office and holding public office was really important. Um, some of my earliest memories are going to rallies and events like this and waving American flags in support of my dad running for governor. And yet, somehow... Oh yes, I'm very biased towards my dad too, so feel free to applaud for him as well. Um, and yet, somehow this election just feels that much more crucial because whomever we elect as our next president will help steward the country and the world that my children will grow up in. And I could not imagine, admittedly, a better grandmother for my children than my mom, um, but I also couldn't imagine a better president partly for the reasons that you heard from the governor and the senator. I want to know that our next president can keep our country safe. I want to know that our next president has a consistent record of standing up against the gun lobby and fighting for smart, sensible gun control. It matters to me that my mother has been fighting for the rights of all children since before I was born. And it matters that my mother always talks about a woman's right to choose and thank you to Planned Parenthood for being here. And those are just a few reasons why I'm so proud to be here. Because I want my children to grow up in a world where they're going to be valued and respected for whomever they are and whomever they love and whatever choices they feel like they have to make for themselves and their families. So... I am just grateful to feel the enthusiasm here, and I'm so grateful to be sharing a stage with probably the only person here who arguably knows my mother better than I do. <laughs> um, I've known my mom my whole life, um, but my father's clearly known her, by definition, for longer. Um, I also think my dad knows a little bit about what it takes to be an effective president for our country. <laughs> so... Since I've, since I've shared a bit about why I'm so strongly supporting my mom, um, I now want to ask my dad, who I think probably has a pretty well-informed opinion himself, about why he's so proud to be standing here with me today in support of my mom, our next president, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Please welcome my father, President Bill Clinton. Thank you. Whoa, thank you. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank all of you who have been out working, knocking on doors, walking the streets. And I, I want to ask you to just keep on doing it until the polls open. I want to thank Governor Hassan and Senator Shaheen, longtime friends of Hillary's and mine, for standing up for her. I went to Sarajevo in Bosnia with Jean Shaheen a few months ago to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the massacre in Srebrenica and the end of the Bosnian War, where more innocent people were killed 
in a place because of their faith and ethnicity than any other place in Europe since the end of World War II. And Jean Shaheen is taking the lead on making sure that democracy survives there and that they continue to be a strong ally of freedom and of the United States. I want to thank Maggie Hassan. One thing our foundation works on is trying to stop the epidemic of prescription drug and heroin abuse since she became one of the first people in the United States to make sure that everybody in New Hampshire could have access to the miracle drug Narcan, which brings kids back and keeps them from dying. Now, I want to thank Mayor Marty Walsh from Boston, who is Exhibit A of the working person's politician and has brought a lot of people from Massachusetts up here to help us. Thank you, former Representative Carol Shea Porter. Thank you, Carol Shea Porter. Thank you, Executive Counselor Chris Pappas. Thanks to our forever friend, Lou D'Alessandro, State Senator D'Alessandro, and State Senator Donna Susi. Thank you, and I'm almost done. <laughs> Thank you, Randy Weingarten, the President of the American Federation of Teachers, and, that, and the National Education Association Executive Committee is here. And thank you, Dr. Susan Heward, the president of this community college. I, I saved her for last because Hillary basically believes the country ought to operate the way a community college does. It's open to all. Nobody graduates saddled with debt. They are prepared for the future where they can get a decent job and have a decent life. And there's a lot of diversity in a community college, a lot of difference of opinion, but you don't can get condemned because of your differences. We embrace it, we rally debate, we discuss things, we try to figure out how to do it. I was the first president ever to speak at a community college commitment, uh, com commencement, and it was in New Hampshire. So here's what I want to say. The hotter this election gets, the more I wish I were just a former president and just for a few months, not the spouse of the next one. Because, <laughs> you know, I have to be careful what I say. And I'm so happy all the time because of our granddaughter and a grandchild to be that I'm not mad at anybody, but I respect the anger, the apprehension, and the anxiety that so many Americans have. I understand people who get madder every day when they keep reading we're the best performing economy in the world. We've grown 14 million jobs in five years, and yet 84% of the people haven't had an increase in their income since the crash. Half of the people after inflation are living on what they were the last day I was in office. The great Irish poet William Butler Yeats said, too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. So we need big changes, that's right. You'll hear Hillary talk about her vision for that. But in my life, I have learned two things. One is when you get done with all this, the only thing that matters is whether people are better off when you quit than when you started and whether children have a brighter future and whether we're coming together or being torn apart. The rest is background music. So the real question is not do we need big changes? Yes, the real question is who's got the best ideas and who'd be the best change maker? And therefore, it's the only thing I'm going to say about this. It bothers me to be in an election where debate is impossible because if you disagree, you're just part of the establishment. You'll have to forgive me, but I don't think your governor and your senator, I don't think of them as establishment politicians wedded to the old ways. Nor do I think of the governor of Vermont, the only governor in the country to try to get single-payer health care who had to give it up because it would have doubled the budget of the state and it wouldn't pass, that's hardly an establishment credential. I'm grateful that he's supporting Hillary. And the senior senator from Vermont, America's number one champion of human rights around the world in the Senate. That doesn't strike me as establishment. Or let me give you another example. All these Arkansas travelers that are here, look at them. <laughs> who paid their way here. Some of them had some distress themselves to tell about the person they know. 
One of them, and I don't want to embarrass him, one of them is our immediate past Senator Mark Pryor, who was defeated in the landslide in 2014, the Republicans had, in large measure because he voted for the health care law. That doesn't strike me as establishment, and nobody alive in my state thinks he lost because people thought he wasn't liberal enough. Change is hard, and it's worth the effort. I am so grateful for all the millennial young people who are supporting Hillary. And why? They're just as mad as the ones who aren't. It's just that they know they got to translate their anger into answers and their resentment into results. So here's what I want to tell you. From the day I met her 40 years, 45 years ago next month to this morning when we got up and she was trying to explain to me what was going on. <laughs> she's the best change maker I've ever known. And you just got to decide what that makes. I asked Mark Pryor what he said to people when he was knocking on doors. He said, look, I like them both. I serve with them both. But she gets a lot more done. We need somebody who gets something done. And so when we met in law school, weren't many women in law school then. She was helping with legal services to poor people. Then she spent a fourth year to go to the Yale Child Study Center to learn about the challenges children face in America, especially poor children. Then she went to work for the Children's Fence Fund. She went to Alabama to end the tax exemption that bogus academies were getting because there were nothing more than segregated schools. Then she went to South Carolina to find out why so many African-American teenagers were being trapped in adult prisons for years and years and years, having their lives and future ruins. Then she came home to Arkansas, opened our first legal clinic in the most Republican area of the state, rural, conservative. Then she started our first preschool program where there was no such thing as preschool, something she found in Israel. She got the woman to come all the way from Israel to Arkansas, and pretty soon I was going to little preschool graduations <laughs> with parents who became their kids' first teachers. There are now, this is all over the country now, there are thousands of young people who went through one of these hippie programs, who learned more, went further, and are having better lives today just because she always makes something good happen. They have no idea she did it. She always makes something good happen. <clears throat> and the White House, <clears throat> and remember this in the health care debate, in the White House when we tried to get health care, the experts say we had a really good plan. We just didn't have 60 votes in the Senate. There's not been a single change in health care in 60 years plus since Harry Truman tried to get universal health coverage that didn't have 60 votes in the Senate to break a Republican filibuster. She just kept working. She and Senator Kennedy and others worked on the Children's Health Insurance Program, stuck it in the Balanced Budget Act in 1996. 76% of Republicans wound up voting for it. There were 5 million kids getting health care when we left office. There are now nine today. It's an integral part of the Affordable Health Care Act. She just made something good happen. She worked with a House Republican leader who did not like me, to put it mildly, to increase by 65% the number of kids that were being adopted out of foster care by giving a tax credit for adopting a child with disability or giving people incentives to adopt older children because they were afraid to adopt non-infants. She just made something good happen. In the Senate, she was a walking, make something good happen person. And everything she did just about had Republican support, getting $20 billion for New York City to rebuild after 9-11. Not just buildings, lives. She met a woman who was engaged on 9-11, survived, but had to have, I can't remember, 10 or 11 plastic surgeries to get her life back. Her fiancé stayed with her. And so did Hillary, and she'll stay with you. She helped the farmers. She helped the small manufacturers. And she helped the veterans. First, to make sure they got the same health care if they were in the National Guard and Reserves as the military did. 
She did that with Lindsey Graham. Then with John McCain to make sure they treated people with traumatic brain injuries and post-traumatic stress syndrome. She was on the Alzheimer's caucus, and she was the first presidential candidate ever to have a position on autism. And one reason she wants paid leave is so people can take care of their family members with severe conditions. And she just made something good happen. And as Secretary of State, she can tell you about that, but I'll tell you this. Henry Kissinger, of all people, said she ran the State Department better and got more out of the personnel of the State Department than any Secretary of State in decades, and it's true. And she negotiated the Iran sanctions. She negotiated a treaty with Russia that reduces the threat of nuclear war. It's the one thing that survives our efforts to get along with Mr. Putin. It took 67 votes in the Senate. She got them. A lot of Republicans. All her life, she did make something good happen. Yesterday, Hillary went to Flint, Michigan. And she talked about what a horrible moral failing what they're going through was not just a financial one, but we have to do something about it. The most revealing answer to me as someone who is president, not her husband, to any question reflected well on both Hillary and her opponent in terms of their values. At the end of the debate in South Carolina, the moderator says, is there anything we should have talked about that we haven't? And he called on Hillary first. She said, yeah, I want to talk about that lead in the water in Flint. And she knew exactly what too much lead can do to a baby yet to be born. A baby can come out with a very smaller head and a smaller brain. And even those that don't seem to be physically damaged can be damaged and their whole life can be taken away from them. And there's lead in more pipes than in Flint. And she, she talked about it. And she said, I called the mayor. I said, can I send somebody to see you? My staff member went down. The mayor said, what you can really do, Hillary, is to get me the money I need because I asked for this much money to take care of this, and the state only gave me 10%. So I want you to go on television, do an interview, and tell them, don't talk about your campaign. Don't talk about anything. Talk about us and tell people why we need the other 90%. One, two, three, four, five. She did. They got the money. Now, and she would be the first to tell you that's probably not the only reason, but it didn't do any harm. Our opponent was just as outraged, just as upset. He said the governor should resign. And maybe he should, but I doubt if he cares what two Democrats running for president think about it. In other words, you want a president who's good on the great days when you sign a bill to put up 500 million solar panels or a bill to get 100% insurance coverage, who's great on the tough days when something bad happens, and who's great on all the other days. You want a president who every day says, what can I do to make it better? So that's my pitch. We can't get in a place where we're so mad that we demonize anybody who's against us, where we can't have an honest discussion about who's got a better health care plan, where everybody who's on the other side is part of some mythical establishment, including people like Planned Parenthood and the Human Rights Campaign Fund. We can't do that. We have to do this like this community college works together and producing results together. And so I would like to bring to the stage not only someone I've been married to 40 years, but who for 45 years has made everything she touched and everybody she touched better. The single best change maker I have ever known. Hillary Rodham Clinton.